We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a topic from Uncle Rico, who writes, Hey, Tabletop Bellhop, have any good filler card game recommendations? Mm -hmm. Just picked up Push and No Thanks, and looking for more games to play with the extended family. Well, thanks for the question, Uncle Rico. And I got to say, with those two games, you're off to a great start. While I think most people listening know that I do tend to prefer heavier, longer games, there is still a spot in my collection and my game nights for some filler games. For me, filler games serve a few different purposes. To start, I think they're a great icebreaker, something you break out at the very start of game night to just get everyone in that gaming mindset and to get everyone's focus on the table instead of milling about and socializing and chatting. Most filler games are really good, though, so that you can still chat and hang out while playing so it's it's good to get that you know talk in the hey what's going on how was your work week what have you been doing how are the kids and all that that chit chat that kind of get it out of the way while you're playing the fielder game so that you can focus on the heavier games later not to mention great for when you're just waiting on that one or two more people mm -hmm. who haven't shown up yet and you want to fill the time exactly i wonder why they're called fillers Next up, I love having filler games on hand for game nights with large groups. Like I, I have a fairly extensive game room and I will have 12 people or more over on for special events, usually birthdays, New Year's, not on an average game night, but we'll have three or four different games going at once. Plus, I had, at least back when we could, I hosted a ton of public play events almost every weekend here in Windsor. And I love having filler games for both. Now, their role here is something different. What these are for is for someone, something for people to play while waiting for people. Now, these are great with kind of like what Sean mentioned, where you're, where you're waiting for people to show up, but even more so. So you're waiting for people to show up or you just showed up to the event and everyone's already busy playing something. I like having some filler games on hand that are dead simple so that people can sit down and play them while waiting for, you know, the main tables or waiting for one game to finish. And that's also true in the middle of the event. So you got three different tables of people playing and they all kind of want to switch up and play with different people in the next round. Well, if one table finishes first, they can always pick up a filler game or something quick to play while waiting for the other tables to finish. So I always have filler games with me anytime I go to host a game night. Right, and, and just a brain break between heavier stuff can be helpful too, which leads us to... Having fillers on hand just to unwind. After playing an epic three or four hour or six hour game, sometimes I just want to break and I want to play something more casual. These are also great for filling the gap at the end of game night. So you're playing until 10 o'clock and you wrap up at 9.15, 45 minutes isn't enough time to start another game at Terraforming Mars, but that's the perfect chance to break out some type of filler game and tie one on before calling it a night. Well, and getting back to Uncle Rico's question, they aren't just looking for filler games, but filler hard game specifically. Right. And they also note games for playing with extended family, which I'm going to guess are non-gamers. Yeah, usually when people talk about gaming with extended family, they're not talking about, you know, the hardcore war gamers over at Uncle Billy's house. Card-based games, I think, are perfect for this because most non-gamers are at least familiar with playing card games, right? They know a standard deck of bicycle playing cards. They probably know how to play solitaire. They may know euchre, spades, hearts, or poker, or some other form of card gaming. So getting them to play a non-playing card game, but a game with cards, is going to be way easier than throwing down some score-based resource management Euro game. Cards with numbered pictures are just familiar, even if the pictures aren't. Dropping a hex map and some sheep down might scare off people. Totally agree. So what follows is going to be a list of card-based filler games that I personally have enjoyed. Now, this style of game is very popular, both on the hobby side of things as well as in the mass market. And there are a ton of card games that play in 15 minutes to half an hour. Like, that's just a huge category. So there's no way this list should be considered all-inclusive. This isn't even close. I know I haven't played them all. So also, please don't get mad if I didn't list your favorite game because there's just a good chance I haven't tried it yet. I'm not going to get to most or all, definitely not all, probably not even most, maybe not even many of the games in this genre. What I am going to get to, though, are the ones that I personally had the most fun playing and the games I would consider bringing out to game nights myself out of my collection. Now, as usual, this list is in no particular order. All right. 
I am going to start off with the one Uncle Rico mentioned that he just picked up, which is No Thanks, which I think this is one that should be in almost everyone's collection. Now, Uncle Rico already has a copy, so he doesn't need this suggestion, but this is for anyone else looking to pick up a filler game. Now, I tried this game when my friend Jamie introduced it to me back in the days when I would have sworn I don't like filler games. When I was like, I don't want to play this. Let's play a real game. Like, this is a joke party game. I don't want to do this because the game is dead simple to learn. You have a bunch of numbered cards. Someone passes you a card. You either keep the card or you toss a chip on it and say, nope, thanks. And then you pass it along to the next person. And it just keeps going around until eventually someone's got to take the cards, but then they get the chip so they can say no later, right? And this is one of those games where you don't want points. So you don't want any cards. But the neat bit here is that if you are able to make a straight of any length, only the lowest number in that straight counts. That's the brilliance of no thanks. And despite my aversion to filler games at that time, I've had a lot of ton fun playing no thanks it has the added bonus of actually having a higher player count too so it's great for those group events to get everyone playing together before you split up and that was no thanks next i've got gorus maximus i wanted to put this on the list just as to, to counter off the fox in the forest which i think i might have actually taken fox in the forest off the list since then because fox in the forest only plays two players so one recommended if you, if you want a two-player game to have on hand fox in the forest is good and i totally forgot that i took fox in the forest off and i'm keeping this on because the whole reason for this one is it's got a huge player count scale it is a trick-taking game so think hearts euchre poker but you can play up to eight players and just having an eight-player trick-taking game that works, I think, is brilliant. Um, there's a neat mechanic in here where the trump can change halfway through a suit, which I think is kind of neat. It's got some really cool-looking, but gory artwork. I am a big fan of Gorus Maximus. Just check out the blog. You can find the review or find our podcast when we reviewed it. As we mentioned before when talking about Gorus Maximus, there is also a much more family-friendly version called Sea Change. Yes. But that was Gorus Maximus. Next, I've got Flip City. This is a small box deck building game with a static market. So meaning that what's available in the market is always the same. For a deck builder, it's super easy to teach and features really unique mechanic with two-sided cards where while playing some cards, you can upgrade other cards and to upgrade them, you just flip them to the other side. At two players, this is a quick filler. Now, I do have to warn you, if you go up to the full player count of four, it does slow down. So it might be a little longer than you want for a filler. But with two or three, you should be able to get in a game in under half an hour. And what I love about this is it's got that feel of a bigger deck building game. And I don't know any of the bigger deck building games that can be played that quickly. And that was Flip City. Next, I have one that I know Sean is a fan of, and that is Sushi Go, the pick and pass card game. This is one of the most pure drafting games I've ever played. And by drafting here, we're not drafting from a central market, but rather you have a hand of cards, you keep one card, and you pass the rest to another player. This is really simple to teach and play, and it's very easy. It's just a matter of trying to collect sets of different types of sushi. Like, I basically taught you how to play right now. All I'd be able to have to explain is how the different types of cards score. This is great for non-gamers because it's so approachable. It's so simple. And the cute sushi artwork just makes it very approachable. Now, there is a party edition, which, as far as I can tell, is the better way. I'll admit I haven't tried it myself. It supposedly has some rule tweaks and is bigger for an even bigger group. So if you can get it and you have big group, like if you're, you're always playing with your friends, your four players, look at Sushi Go. But if you're ever bringing out the parties or public play events, you probably want to look for the Sushi Go party edition. And that was the game I have played 90 times on Board Game Arena, Sushi Go. Next, I have a game that I wouldn't have put on this list until I was bribed with beer to play it at a game convention because I just thought I would hate it. Uh, that's Happy Salmon. Note, Jen, I never got that beer. Now, this is a game I still kind of hate because I hate trying to play something else when there's a group of people playing happy salmon in the room this is the loudest most raucous game i have ever seen and heard groups playing this just take over whatever space they're in so be aware of that if you're the only people playing great but if someone's sitting over in the corner trying to teach an 18xx maybe you want to keep happy salmon or go play outside or something 
Now this game is dumb, silly fun where players are going to flip a card over and it's going to tell you to do something. And you have to find someone else doing that same action, whether that's like a high five, a happy salmon, which is like this slappy thing, or you flip spots in the room and you're running around and playing cards and it's just crazy fun. Now the winner is the first one to go through all the cards in the front of them. And I, I thought I'd hate it, but I got to admit, and I hadn't had the beer yet. I actually had quite fun, quite a bit of fun playing happy salmon. But again, don't play it when other people are trying to focus on anything near you. And that was Happy Salmon. All right, sticking with light, silly games, I've got Monster Match. This is going to be one I'm going to consider a hidden gem because when I did research on this, because every time I do one of these lists, I do it on my own, and then I go look and I try to find other people's top 10 lists and go, oh, did I forget anything? No one had this game on their list, so this, this has got to be hidden gem. This is also from North Star Games, same publisher as Happy Salmon, and it's a game called Monster Match. This is like calm Happy Salmon, sort of. It's, it's still real-time, loud, silly fun, but you can play it sitting down. Like, you're, you're around a table. You're not jumping around. You're not slapping people. You're not swapping spots or anything like that. Now, this is a matching game where you're going to put a bunch of cards out on the table that pictures of monsters. And then you're going to roll two dice. One dice has a number on it, and the other one will have features. So it'll say legs, arms, tentacles, eyes, and mouths, maybe, or teeth. I forget. And they'll say, like, six eyes. And you have to find a monster on the board that has six eyes and put your finger on it. And if someone else has their finger on it, they don't get to take the card. Then everyone keeps the cards they were able to get. At the end of the game, once you're through the entire deck, whoever has the most monsters in front of them wins. Dead simple. Like this is, your kids could play this. Like six-year-olds could probably play this. Though they'd have to be able to count, know what a six is. So as long as your kids can count, you can play this game. This is a perfect non-gamer party game, drinking game, get people interacting with each other. And the kind of game you can easily convince non-gamers to play because it feels more of an activity than a game. And it's super cute artwork. This is one I actually wish I owned. I played it at Origins. I've got to thank uh, Newer Boons for showing me the game. So great hidden gem because no one else seems to be talking about this game. Now, that was Monster Match, but I want to point out that it is not the 2002 Ravensburger Monster Match. Oh. It is a newer uh, game by a number of uh, publishers such as Cosmos and North Star Games which is yeah, the North America, it's North Star Games. The 2018 Monster Match. Oh, there you see. I played it the year it came out at Origins then. Up next, we have one that I'm pretty sure everyone expected to be on this list, and that is Codenames. Uh, this is a great filler game for pretty much any size group. You can even go down as small as two, but you will have to pick up the duet edition of Codenames. I am recommending either, to be honest. Uh, the duet version is cooperative, and the other one's competitive. You're going to split into teams, and players are trying to get the members of their teams to pick out words, word cards, based on one-word clues. Now, you have to be careful to not have your team pick the other team's words, and you got to watch out for the dreaded assassin word, where if anyone picks that, their whole team loses. Now, the thing that's great about Codenames as a filler is that you can stop after any round. Like, I assume there's some kind of scoring system in Codenames. Duet, I know their system. It's, it's different. It's a win or lose. There's, but there's like a campaign mode. The Codenames must have some kind of scoring system. But honestly, in the number of times I play the game, I don't even know what it is. We just play until we're sick of it. What's great about this one is you can play one round just to get everyone at the table together to play. Or you can actually just keep playing all night. I have seen a game night at the uh, Green Bean downtown here in Windsor where there was a game of Codenames going the entire event for six hours. We set up a game at the beginning and people came and went, but the whole night there was Codenames going. So uh, the official rules state that the game ends when all of one team's agents are identified or when one team has identified the assassin. So it's one round. So there is no camp. I thought there might have been like, and the team gets points, and then the first one does nope. so many points. <laughs> no, none of that. Nope. But that now, was one thing I do nope. like about Code Names too is this is also a really good get to know each other game. So if you're doing public play gaming, this is a good one where the where um usually when the round ends, you have this like Q and A period where you're like what the heck did that clue mean? Or how was that supposed to relate to that? And then someone tells some story about, oh, when we were camping one time, there was this time and I thought Dave would get that. That is an actual big part of the social aspect of code names that I think is great for that playing with extended family or playing with playing in public or with strangers. Absolutely. And that was code names. Next, Uncle Rico did say code name card games. 
But I think I'll include this card-driven activity, which is the mind anyway. No, I'm joking. I do think this is a game. I just know every time we mention that someone's going to come up and try to tell me it's not a game. You can win or lose in the mind. That alone makes it a game. There are rules. You can win, you can lose. Done. Anyway, the mind is another one that works great at many different player counts. And honestly, in my opinion, works going above the recommended four players. Because for some reason, the mind says it's limited to four. But like I played with as many as eight. Now, I will admit, I'm pretty sure there's not enough cards in the game to get through all 13 rounds with more players. But I don't think you're going to make it that far anyway, because <laughs> the mind is rather difficult. Uh, in this game, players are trying to play numbered cards and from their hands in sequential order. But the trick is you can't communicate with each other. What I'd also like about the mind is all you need is the ability to count to play this. So this one's great for non-gamers and kids. Absolutely. And that was the mind. Next, I have another classic for sale. This is a real estate-based Stephen Dora game that's great for introducing those family members who have fond memories of Monopoly. So if they liked Monopoly, you're like, oh, you mean like games like Monopoly? You're like, yeah, I kind of like Monopoly because you buy and sell property, right? This is a great one to kind of slip in there for those Monopoly fans. Now, this one does need at least three players, but plays up to six. And the game's broken into two rounds. The first round, you're auctioning off properties to everyone. You go through the whole deck, so everyone amasses a bunch of properties. And then the second round, you're trying to sell those properties and hopefully make a profit. The player with the most money at the end wins. This is also a great gateway to heavier economic games. So if you want to, if people like, wow, that was so much better than Monopoly, because anyone who plays for sale better say that. And then you're like, oh, let me introduce you to Power Grid, right? It's, it's, the, it's, it's the gateway for, for heavier economic games. And that was for sale. Next, I have Biblios, which I wanted to talk about next because it reminds me a bit of for sale. That's because it also has two phases, though the phases are kind of the opposite of for sale, because in the first phase, players are distributing a hand of cards to themselves and the other players, as well as a draw deck. So you're going to draw as many cards as the number of players plus one. You're going to keep one for yourself. You're going to give one to each of the other players, and you're going to put one in the draw deck. After all cards are distributed, you now enter an auction phase where those cards you gave yourself are your money to purchase the cards that you put in the draw deck. It's a really fascinating system. Um, it is a little bit more complicated. Um, end game scoring is based on having the majority in different book types. So there is a majority system here. And the, but during the game, you can actually change the value of the different types. So that's another aspect. Uh, this has a few more idiosyncrasies than other games on the list. Uh, this is one, like, you probably don't want to give it to complete non-gamers, right? But like, if they've got some gaming experience, you may be able to slip Biblios in there. Or maybe you follow it up after playing for sale. But that was Biblios. Next, I have Arboretum. So we're going to, again, stick with somewhat harder games, right? Something heavier. This tree-based game is what I like to call a thinky filler. You're using cards with beautiful artwork of different tree species on them, and you're attempting to build an Arboretum by playing the cards in front of you. Now, points are awarded for having straights of trees, so they have to go up in number. All the numbers have to be connected, or the trees going up in number have to be connected orthogonally. Now, there's some really cool stuff here that adds depth to the game that I don't want to get into too much detail here. But, like, you can draw cards from other players' discard piles. There's a whole area majority system to determine who gets to score which trees. So even if you have the biggest route, if you don't have that majority, you don't even get to count it. Uh, this one is actually quite the brain burner. But we found the theme and the artwork draws people in, and even people who normally don't like to think while they're playing games, we'll enjoy this. We'll take the time to learn it. So like, oh, but it looks so beautiful. I want to learn this game. And that was Arboretum. Swapping back to some lighter fare, I've got Bean. Longtime listeners of the show will all know we are all, all three of us, big fans of Bonanza. Uh, this is a bean trading and planting game where there's one rule that is so hard to get people to follow at first, and that's that you cannot rearrange your hand of cards. You must always play your cards from the front of your hand, and newly drawn cards go to the back. Now, the thing with putting this game on this list is depending on how many players you have and how much those players negotiate with each other, it can really stretch uh, the length of the game and can kind of push the limits of being a filler. 
Now, what I do recommend if you are short on time, that you just play through the deck twice instead of three times or possibly even once. And that was Bonanza, a regular favorite here on this show. Yeah. It's probably the oldest game we mention the most often, to be honest. Like that, that's that's Uwe Rosenberg before he was known for polyominoes, made a game about beans. Next, I have another hidden gem. This is another one I couldn't find on anyone else's list. And to be honest, no one seems to know this game exists. I was sent a copy of this from Z-Man Games years ago for Extra Life and to play it at Extra Life and talk about playing it right at the time. This is before I even reviewed games. And that's a game called Parade. This is a Alice in Wonderland themed card game with just beautiful cards. Players are taking part in a parade to honor the Queen of Hearts. And you're playing cards into a growing row of cards, which represents all the people in the parade. Now, what card you play can affect the cards in the row and where you get rewarded by doing things like matching colors to the last card or playing cards of a higher number than the current length of the parade. So if there's five cards in the parade, you play a six, you actually get to collect some cards. Now, a lot of people out there love the card game guillotine and people are probably wondering uh, or they're guessing I'm going to have that on this list and I'm not because I actually think parade handles that whole card row mechanic. I don't know what the term for that. Like we talk about trick taking, talk about ladder games. There's got to be a term for that guillotine style and parade style game, but whatever, whatever that's called, I think guillotine does a better job of it. I think it's more fun. And I also find it's less random. So I feel like I have more control of my destiny in parade. And this is a great one for people who recognize cards because they just look like playing cards with Alice in Wonderland art no they don't have art spades diamonds but they're color coded and they just have numbers and all that really matters is the number and the color interestingly uh board game geek calls it me mechanism card line card line card fair line. enough i guess card line games yeah right. so that was parade now sticking with the whole based on traditional card games theme i'm going to add to the list diamonds this one's for your family members or non-hobby gamers that like traditional card games trick-taking games like spades or hearts and this is while i have more fun playing gorus maximus this is much more approachable for people who understand spades and hearts in particular because it's based on the same mechanic because in diamonds you are trying to collect the most diamonds but not diamond cards but rather diamond tokens it plays like a traditional trick-taking game, except in this one, you get a bonus for playing off-suit. And when you do so, you manipulate the diamond tokens in play. Things like putting them in your vault where they can't be stolen, gaining diamonds from the bank, or stealing diamonds from other players, and so on. Now, the one big advantage that Diamonds has, which I keep it in my collection for this, is that it plays six players where heart spades and poker tend to be four player only games. So it's good when you've got that fifth or sixth player around. And that was Diamonds. Honshu is my next game, and I put it on this list because it's one of the most unique card games I own because it did or does something totally unique. At least when it came out, it was unique because since then there's been three or four games that use this mechanic. But when Honshu came out, this was new because each card in Honshu is divided into six squares showing different terrain types. So you've got like lakes and residential areas and deserts and forests. And there's a couple resource generation spots and then spots that can consume those resources. Well, the neat bit here is you play, start off with one card in front of you and then every card you play afterwards has to go under your existing cards or above them so that one's nested under the other. So so at least one square of the new card is showing and you don't completely cover up another card. So this game's all about tucking cards under other cards to build the city, which I think is fascinating. Now, scoring is based on all kinds of things, like who has the biggest residential area or what, whatever your biggest residential area is. Um, consuming those resources I mentioned, uh, you get extra points for lakes, but if they're only one size, they're worth nothing. But for every one past that, they're worth three. Uh, the, the scoring is the most complicated part of this game. Now, there is a follow-up to this game called Hokkaido that I've heard is even better, but it's still on my pile of shame due to the copy I have missing all the resource cubes. And I keep meaning to pull out my copy of Honshu and see if they're compatible, if I can just steal the cubes from the others. And honestly, if this is half as good as Honshu, I can easily recommend it. Like, I'd, I'd almost want to say Hokkaido should be on this list, but I haven't played it. So check out either of them hopefully in the next couple of weeks i've actually i reread the rules for hokkaido and it does a neat thing where there's a mountain in the middle and then you have to split all your stuff and you only score your lowest your smallest version so like your city split by this mountain and only your smaller of your two city scores so you have to try to balance each side of the mountain sounds really good well and that was honshu and possibly its follow-up hokkaido 
Up next, I want to go back into the party game realms with something pretty close to the new hotness here, something we don't always talk about on the Tabletop Bellhop. That is medium. This one is great due to handling two to eight players. Though with eight, you may want to play until you're bored instead of playing a full game because it may take a lot longer than you'd expect. Now, in medium, you and the player on your left each draw a card, read the read word on the card out loud, word or words on the card out loud, and then on the three count, say the word that's the medium between the two words. This is something that both of the words have in common. And you're both saying this at once. And of course, you're going to say the same word, right? Well, if you fail, you try again, but now you're using the words you just said. And if you don't get it this time, you get one more chance with those words. And then you score points based on making matches. So if you were able to make a match, a, a connection, a psychic connection with the player on your left, you get some points. This, I am surprised by how well this game plays. I, I would say it's almost an intimate experience playing two players. A great game for date night, as well as a good card game, filler card game. Absolutely. I just comedy at every turn during this game yes. it's, you, you can't keep a straight face for long during medium again that was medium next i have ratuki this is a rather old card game that was recently reprinted by the op this is a real-time ladder climbing game where players are playing cards from their hand into a number of growing decks in the center of the table. Now, every deck has to start at one, but every card played after that has to be one higher or one lower than the card that's currently on the top of one of the decks. Now, when you play a five onto a stack, you say Retuki, and you claim that whole stack of cards. After everyone's played all the cards they can, you count up the cards you've claimed. Now, the game does include a scoring system where you're meant to play multiple rounds, kind of like playing hearts where you're aiming for 200 eventually, but you can just play a single round. And that's where this is a perfect filler is you just keep playing rounds of Ratuki until you're ready to start the other game or the other game table finishes up. And that is Ratuki. Now, jumping back to new games, I have the Hidden Gem Scora. Except for a few reviewers I know who got copies of this, I don't not see anyone talking about this game, and it's a shame. This is a Viking-themed card set collection game with a fishing theme that features some really striking artwork. Everyone that sees pictures I share of this is like, ooh, what game is that? I love the cards. Now, Scora is an interesting mix of take that set collection and area control that plays lightning fast. Like, we're talking 15 minutes or under, not half an hour. It's actually one of the shortest fillers on our list tonight, but actually features surprisingly deep gameplay for a game that plays so quickly. And I strongly check, recommend checking out our Scora review to learn more. And that was Scora. Speaking of games with striking looking cards, next I've got Lotus. This is a game about making flowers featuring some of the best looking flower card art I've ever seen. Every card features one petal of a flower type, and when played, you put it on top of the other cards already in play to make a complete flower. And then, while completing flowers is a big part of the game, this is actually an area control game where the player with the most control points gain all the cards in the completed flower. Note, that may not necessarily be the person who played the last card on the flower. This is actually a surprisingly deep game, which again is very accessible because of the theme. It's it's easy to get non-gamers to play it. It's like, oh, it's a game about building flowers. And the scoring really isn't all that complicated. And that was Lotus. All right, we're nearing the end. Um, it ends up, I did this unintentionally, but I got a string of games here with great artwork because that's the last three. I have some of the best looking art I've seen in card games. And this next one is Kodama, The Tree Spirits by Daniel Solis. This is a game with artwork that looks like it's ripped right out of a Studio Ghibli movie. It's a drafting game where players are growing trees and scoring points for connecting branches with different elements on them. Now, the brilliant part in this game is the players start the game with a number of scoring cards in their hand, and every season out of four seasons, you have to score one of them. So this leads to a really high level of long-term planning and strategy of when, what scores, what cards you want to score when. Now, I will admit, I've had mixed results with this one as far as non-gamers are concerned. Some people get it right away, some don't. Now, the majority of people are willing to sit down and figure it out and play twice in a row once they get it, because it usually takes one game to get it, due to the unique theme and the whole, oh, I built this really cool-looking tree and that Ghibli-like artwork. And that was Kodama, the Tree Spirits. 
my last game on the list I actually added when I was collecting games for our backdrop, and that was Dead Man's Draw. This is actually my all-time favorite push-your-luck game. The Rally Man GT may beat it out now that I've been playing more rounds of that. Very different style of push-your-luck game, though. I actually quite some Quillenbergs up there, too. All right, before I play these modern games, as far as card games go, this was, for a long time, my favorite push-your-luck game. Um, you're drawing cards from a central deck, so everyone's drawing from the same deck. You're going to flip up the top card and do whatever it says. Well, it doesn't say anything. It's got a symbol on it. It's, all, it's, it's language independent. And then it's going to, the cards you flip up, is going to do things like let you draw more cards, like draw three cards and pick one to play or remove a card from the, the card row, I think is what we said they're called. The uh, card, card row. line. Card line. The card line. Sorry, remove a card from the card line or take a card from your person and put it in your personal tableau or steal a card from other players. There's all kinds of, I can't remember the number of different cards, but there's like nine different types of cards in this game. And then once you've done it, you then have to decide, do you draw again? And if you draw again, you again do the effect on the card. You can keep doing that. The problem is at any point, you can stop. You're like, I'm done. I'm good. And you just collect all the cards in the card line. And they go in your tableau, and it, there's a scoring system for that. But if you choose to push your luck, and if you draw a single duplicate card of any that are already up there, you bust, and you get nothing. And there's also cracking cards, and if you draw a cracking card, you also instantly bust. Now, if you like push your luck games at all, you need to own this game. Like everyone who loves quick playing, fast playing, push your luck, like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, that feeling when you're flipping a card, you love this game. It's a fantastic push your luck game. And that was Dead Man's Draw. All right. I do have four honorable mentions that I thought I needed to bring up tonight. Um, so we're going to go through those pretty quickly. I got a little bit to say about them, and I'll note, it, note why were they were not on the list, and there are a variety of reasons. Up first, I've got just one. This is a party game that people love. This takes the usual person gives a clue and everyone has to guess and turns it on its head where one person has to guess and everyone gives the clue. Except if anyone gives the same clue as someone else, it gets wiped out and can't be used. That just sounds brilliant. I have heard so many good things about this game. And the only reason it's not on the list is I haven't actually had the chance to play this game. But that was just one. Next is one I'll probably get some feedback for, and that is Love Letter. Uh, this is an extremely popular card game that only features 18 cards and some scoring tokens. It kind of took the gaming world by storm. Um, it spawned a number of variations and intimidations, some of which people seem to like more than others. The thing is, I haven't really enjoyed any version of Love Letter all that much. It's okay. I get the game. I just don't find it all that fun. I think the main thing is that it's supposed to be a bluffing game and to play it well, people have to bluff. And I've played it with people who play it mechanically and I'm not a huge fan of bluffing games in the first place. So I'm putting it on the honorable mentions because so many other people out there love, love a letter. It may work for you, but I am not a fan of it. Yeah. And uh, so that was love letter, which uh, I'm going to find point out, talk about later in some, to some degree, to one of the top 40 games in the world at some point. Yes, at one there point. you go. See, I told you it was popular. Uh, the fact that love letter leads to bluffing leads me to my next game because that is coup, which is a game that also requires bluffing. I've said many times in the show, I don't really like social deduction games. And well, coup is a pretty pure social deduction game. Now I will say of all the social deduction games I played, especially the ones that are based on werewolf, this was my favorite, but it's still really not my kind of game. This is a hidden role game where players select teams to go on missions, except some of the players are spies or saboteurs, and they're there to screw things up. And the whole goal is for the non-saboteurs to figure out who the saboteurs are and manage to complete a set number of missions before the game ends. And while the spies are there to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, this is definitely like, it, it, it spawned from the need for werewolf or mafia that's shorter and doesn't need a moderator. And I think it succeeds brilliantly at that. It's just not my kind of game. And that was Coop. 
Final game on my list is Saboteur, and based on what I just said about Koo, you can easily guess why this game didn't make the main list. Uh, this is another hidden wool game with a lot of backstabbing. Um, I thought it meant to be mentioned here because it's very popular, especially here in Windsor. I don't know how popular Saboteur is anywhere else gaming, but I have seen so many games of this being played. I know Sean has even played it on Board Game Arena. I have some friends that love this game about dwarves exploring a gem mine and trying to suss out who's the saboteur who's just looking to collapse the mines and get away with everything on their own just not a fan of that style of game but it's popular and i wanted to mention it in case you do dig that style of play and i would personally recommend not playing it on board game arena despite my love of board game arena uh i too have not enjoyed saboteur digitally at least but that was saboteur and that's it for our list of great filler card games today now we're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions or further suggestions. All right, lobbyists, now that you've heard what we were able to come up with, what do you have to add? And I've seen quite a chat here. Yeah, it's awesome. There's some great stuff going on in the chat room tonight. I got to say, next time we do one of these, I got to give a couple to you. That was a lot of me talking. Sorry. Room. Yeah, no, I should have I should have pulled some of those over. Your, your <laughs> I should have was... gave you a love letter and your, your, voice, and... your voice was rough already yeah. on that, uh, tonight. That was, that was bad for that me. That was I'm a sorry. lot of talking. Well, my other problem was the list was 21. And then I went downstairs to grab them for the, the backdrop. And I was like, oh, Dead Man's Draw. <laughs> oh, Medium. Like, why didn't I think of these games? Once I'm actually looking at my games, I right. was like, I got to throw these on the list. And I actually cut some out, like the Fox in the Forest. And I totally forgot to edit that I took out the Fox so in the one Forest. So I'm going, I'm scrolling back here. One of our first questions is, uh, Board Games and Bourbon wants to know, would the Grizzled be considered a card game? Yes, it's definitely a card game, but I wouldn't call it a filler because it tends to take longer than half an hour. And so that was my limit. I probably should have said that at the top, that my limit here were games that could be played in half an hour or less. That's what I went with for to, to help reduce my options. Right. Now, if I was just talking about great card games, the Grizzle would be here. Or great cooperative card games, the Grizzle would be here. Meaningful card games, the Grizzled. Ga card games with great art, the Grizzled. But for fillers, I'm going to see what BGA says for, uh, or BGG says for time on that one. Uh, next, while you're checking that, Jeff yeah. came in with a classic card games that don't suck list with I, Oh Hell, I, we could do that, Beat the Landlord, and Ricochet Poker. I haven't, I think I played Oh Hell. <laughs> um, no, I personally, I love Hearts. Like, I, my favorite traditional card game is Hearts. I love the ability to screw people by giving them Hearts, and I love the ability to try to shoot the moon if you're behind. Now, Board Games and Bourbons jumps in again with a believe it or not a trick-taking game i haven't heard you mention and that okay. is spookra which is a take on euchre but it's a haunted house sort of uh euchre uh game all right so and it's one a, i have played it's a recent one from steve jackson games called spooks which is a euchre variant that uses halloween themed suits but there are six suits instead of four i have played spooks which is s-p-o-o-k-s but not spookra so Spookra is uh, S-P-O-O-K-R-E from 2018, uh, published by da, 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 Twitch Factory. All right. They should send us a review copy. We review tons <laughs> of, of, of trick-taking games here. Somehow, in the last, 2019, I think, we did a whole slew of trick-taking games unintentionally. Uh, and Jeff is jumping in with a for sale is effing fantastic. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> It is. It's a really good game. Uh, and it's Monopoly, not hard to understand. Monopoly Deal is another one that uh, popped. I, I have up. heard so many good things about it. Neither that. one of us have played it. And I no. tried buying it last Black Friday, and the Amazon locked up, and I could not, it would not let me buy it. Uh, it was one of those things where I could get it for like a buck fifty or something with all the deals, and it would yeah. not let me do it. All right, so the Grizzled on Board Game Geek is listed at 30 minutes. Now, the Armistice Advanced ed Edition that adds campaign play is listed at longer. So, yes, it probably could have been on this list. And to be honest, I will definitely throw it in uh, once we do the show notes, once I do the blog version, I'll probably toss the Grizzled in there. So one I did cut from the list was Lost City. So, probably, like I said, I had the list, and then I added some stuff and took some stuff off. And the two I took off, which I'll list here while we're doing the lobby, which may or may not end up in the full episode. Who knows? Depends how brilliant you folk are in the <laughs> lobby, or if we unintentionally swear, um, is The Fox in the Forest, 
the main reason I took it off is I'm getting sick of talking about the Fox in the Forest. I don't mean that in a bad way, but like it's like every game list we have lately, we mention the Fox in the Forest. And it's kind of like everyone who listened to us knows we like the Fox in the Forest. So I'm throwing that out for that reason. Plus, it's two player only. And the only time two player filler games, like, I think how often when you have date night do you need a filler game? Like, maybe that's what you want to play. But that to me is only for those cases where you got a game night happening in a public play event and two new people show up. And I stop teaching whatever game I'm playing and quickly teach some Fox in the Forest so that they have something to do while we wrap up. And that's the only place it kind of fits. And the other game I had was Lost Cities, which is the old Rainier Nitzia classic, for the exact same reason. It was two-player only. So I dropped it off the list because it's niche of a niche. Though, honestly, I wanted to keep it on the list because I made a cute pun because we used to use that to fill Deanna's lunch time when she worked at the library. I would meet her downtown, and we would go to Ron Bella's The Coffee Exchange downtown. Great coffee shop, better gamer and play Lost Cities to fill the time on our lunch break. So it literally was a filler for us. Uh, Next up, another uh, suggestion from Board Games in Bergen. While you were talking about Arboretum, they mentioned uh, in the same vein, Village Green, which is a brand new 2020 from uh, Osprey Games. Now, Village Green, if I remember, is a retheme of... It's not listed as a retheme. No? No. I'm thinking of Fields of Green then. Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm thinking of something else then. I am I Village Green. I no, I've never even seen that game. Yeah, no, it's that, it's, that it's just new. goes I mean, to it's, show. And and I was I was pointed out in the chat it, with only 378 ratings, it came out during the pandemic, so it's going to be one yeah. of those sleepers that someone's going to have to to push big. So hey, oh, Osprey Games, if you want to come to yeah. send us a copy. <clears throat> Osprey Games doesn't even do cons. Like, like uh, you don't, you don't, you right. can't go to the Osprey booth at Origins and check out Gaslands. Like, they're they're such a weird company for publishing. So, no, that's that's worth checking out. Again, we'll throw that in the show notes once we get that finalized. But no, I have definitely not played played this. Uh, Tech is pointing out uh, we love Point Salad and a little card game called Take the Gold. Now, Point Salad, I have heard fantastic things about that. That one's supposed to be way up there. That was one that either came out just pre-pandemic or shortly after, and I just, I missed it, right? I missed the window to try that one out. So that's probably a good recommendation. I wouldn't be able to put it on the list because I haven't played it. Uh, And then we've got uh, Will Wheaton convinced Board Games and Bourbon that Batman Love Letter is... uh... The way to the go. One to get. <laughs> I've heard the Batman one at least has some unique twists. Of all the ones I played, my favorite was called um, Hefe was in it. And it was about luchador wrestling. And there were little belts that came with, oh, what, El Hefe? Hefe. It's, it's a love letter clone where you're trying, you played your wrestlers and your managers. I don't even remember how to spell Hefe. <laughs> and I know that's how it's pronounced. It's one of the words I know. What is that game called? That was actually really good. And I also like one called Cypher. Oh, that's gotten interesting things. Okay, don't try typing Hefe love letter. <laughs> uh, it meant the boss. So El Hefe, something right. like that. But it was about luchador wrestling. And it used the sort of the love letter thing. But again, with the, the very limited number of cards. Uh, board Game is Bourbon is saying, I want to learn to love Board Game Arena, but every time he does, it feels like those claw games in a carnival. He leaves thinking, I guess this would be fun in real life. I Personally, for me, it is my number one source of board gaming, uh, particularly in the pandemic. So that's that's why I have become a huge BGA fan, fanboy almost uh, Yeah. at this point. I cannot find copies of this game. It and came in the night, drawstring Jeff. bag. Hmm? Uh, Jeff's just heading out. Oh, you um, don't want to hear the, the great review coming up <laughs> after the coffee break? Uh, and a uh, Splendor-like game called Bees. I've heard uh, that's good. That's not a card game, though, is it? Uh, and then uh, Age of War is another uh, accessible filler. Uh, that's stuff. more of a dice game than a card game. So I get it. I like the game. But to me, like, yes, you have cards, but it's all about rolling the dice and filling the cards. It's the same reason Roll For It didn't make the list. Because Roll For It, while it has cards, is much more about rolling those dice to get them to place it. Age of War is a really neat samurai-themed game. And I agree. It's it's a solid game. But it, it was purposely left off this list because I think it's definitely more of a dice game than a card game. Right. All right. Well, that uh, that wraps up what we've got here in the lobby tonight for our ask. No luck on Hefe. 
I'm still looking. It's bugging me. <laughs> I, I can't believe I can't find this game. Like, does it Luc- not exist? Lucador, uh, Luchador, Mexican wrestling dice? I No, there's no dice. <laughs> card game. All right. Remember, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website. Click on Ask the Bellhop. 